Thank you, MJ, and thank you, Lale, for uh, uh, having me here. Thank all of you for inviting me to speak and collaborate with you about this topic, which again is about performance-based curriculum architecture design, and we'll talk a little bit about the process via group process. can be done several different ways, but that's uh, my preference, my default if I can. Uh, this is all about producing uh, performance competence development, guidance for that development using both formal and informal or less formal means. And it's for those who are in an enterprise learning context versus an educational learning context or about performance or personal uh, learning context. Um, so I have a couple of objectives here. One is a multi-part objective, uh, orient you to the four phases that I use that can be reconfigured into three phases or five phases or into other uh, configurations to uh, uh, align with other initiatives that may be going on. We'll talk about the key outputs from an effort and the critical teams of the effort. And then lastly, time allowing, we'll talk about the uh, seven potential benefits for doing something along these lines. And there's many ways to do this, and I've documented and codified all of this into one way, and it looks very rigorous and rigid, but it's very flexible, in fact. So our agenda is I'll give you, uh, have a short uh, open and overview, a little bit about me and my experience in doing all of this. We'll talk about uh, training and development or learning paths and planning guides, and then we'll stop for a little Q&A. Uh, then we'll launch into doing a, a look at the four project phases that I typically use, but not each and every time, and then we'll stop for a little Q&A. Then we'll dive into some of the analysis data that drives the design, and we'll do a little Q&A. And then we'll hit those potential benefits uh, and close out with a little Q&A. So, without further ado here. Um, in my methodology, it's branded, the PAC processes, yada, yada. Uh, I have a common uh, approach to analysis and project planning and management that feeds three levels of instructional design. And we're going to be talking about curriculum architecture design here and not the other two, which are more addy like These are just my approaches to the development of instruction and information to affect performance. And the MCD version of this is more like a traditional ADDI approach. It develops courses or workshops or seminars or whatever you want to call that. But I have a need also some at times to develop components of what might be considered a traditional uh, set of curricula. It may be just the knowledge tests or the performance tests or demonstrations or chunks of information and my client may want me to do that first because they have an immediate need for that. And they want to then build around all of that and create the course. So there's ways to back into that. And that's what that final IAD methodology set is for. It's to basically build components and then potentially come back and surround it with all the rest of the uh, content that you would need to create an instructional package. So clients had forced me to do that uh, years ago and I just learned how to codify all that. Um, my background on curriculum architecture design, I've personally conducted 74 of these projects since my first one back in 1982. I've trained my staff, I'm now a single shingle, but I've had staff in the past and uh, up to 20 people and half of them consultants, half of them production staff. And I trained and certified my consulting staff in these methodologies so that we would be more alike than not in doing projects for clients so that we could go back and and reuse some of the content, and I'll talk a little bit later about uh, reuse of content. It's a big deal to me. Um, and I've developed uh, and certified for my clients hundreds and hundreds of their staff. I co-authored the first published article about curriculum architecture that was in Training Magazine back in the day of 1984. And I've been presenting on this since 1984, started off at the Chicago chapter of NSPI, which is now ISPI, and then did the National Conference in 1985. And I have presented on this at uh, ASTD conferences and at training or Lakewood conferences in the past and at other uh, forums of, uh, of different organizations. Um, I wrote a book in 1999. I started it in 1983. 
Uh, it became Lean ISD. Uh, the late uh, Dr. Gary Rumler wrote this nice review after reading the book. I attribute most of my approaches to analysis to methodologies of his that I learned back in 1979. Um, he, in fact, designed this cover of this book here. He hated the cover that I had uh, previously for it, and uh, without even me asking, or uh, he just sent it to me, and so I decided to honor him and use his cover for my book. Um, that book is available as a free PDF and as a, a paperback book, and there's a limited supply of hardbound books for it, but, uh, so I've tried to give this away fairly freely. All right, that's the end of part one. We're on to part two, and the outputs, and there are, while there are many outputs for the four phases, there's a project plan and target audience data and performance data and knowledge and skill data, and then an assessment of all existing content so that we can reuse content as is or after modification uh, if it should exist because we don't want to reinvent any wheels that's not good uh, stewardship of shareholder equity um, that leads into a design phase where we create training and development modules specs modules are to events as chapters are to books so I have a two level layer modularity of my design in a curriculum architecture and those modules get parked into an inventory framework because if there have been previous projects, we may want to recognize that, oh, some other audience already needed that content, perhaps they've built it and we'll be able to reuse that rather than build uh, redundant content. That rolls into training and development specifications. Event is my language for the final deliverable, the orderable, uh, the, what you would register for, it's the course or whatever language you want to use for that. Um, that all gets sequenced in a suggested sequence on a training development path there with the red circle around it. Um, that's the visual uh, marketing poster, if you will, for this. We'll be looking at a couple examples of those. And associated with every path is a planning guide. Uh, if your LMS doesn't provide you with a planning tool, um, then you would want to have a planning guide to allow people to down-select from the training and development path and take the things that are most important to them, things they don't already know, things that are related to their work performance requirements. Um, and at the end of that, in the final phase, there's a set of priorities established for any gaps that are uncovered because we've tried to reuse existing content as is or after modification. So our path sometimes has those things on it. But what are you going to do about all the gaps? That's currently informal learning, what I used to call unstructured OJT, nowadays informal learning. But unless we formalize that, create content to help the learners learn it to become performers, then it remains unstructured OJT, and they'll have to figure it out by hook or by crook on their own afterwards. One thing about training and development paths, they really need to be as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. So I'm going to show you a couple examples here where, for example, in this Verizon example done in the uh, early 2000s, this was for inbound uh, call center sales reps. There were seven regions, each with its own unique set of regulatory requirements. You know, can call forwarding be bundled with call waiting or not? So there are all sorts of differences in affecting the products that were to be sold, et cetera, et cetera, and all the different state uh, regulatory commissions that dictated what you said at the beginning of a call, in the middle of a call, and at the end of a call. But this was one example of one of seven paths that came out of a project. This is very rigorous. This is lockstep. Everybody starts in the first block up at the top left and then marches through the path as a large group until the very end, unless you'll see by the little traffic lights in there, that signifies this is where we do washout of learners who aren't cutting it. So a guy might wash out after that fifth box because he's just not getting it. And we have performance tests in there, but he's not learning it sufficiently and he probably won't be very good. So we might as well cut to the chase and uh, find uh, something else for him or just let him go. And so there are <clears throat> two of those washout points on the path. And there are also, on this particular one, there's a three little red W's, and because in this context that this group had, uh, they were part, the production floor was right next to where the training was taking place, and in, invariably, management would come in and say, we've got 
uh, too few people out there handling the call volume and we need to take people out of training and put them on the phones and make some sales. Um, and so this was to identify at what point in the learning continuum, in the learning path, could you break people out from the training and they would actually be able to do something on the job. And so those red W's signified that you could do it at those points. They could, they could do certain kinds of performance, but not everything because they weren't through the entire path. But if you took them out before that, mm, it may be not worthwhile to do that because they may not handle the calls adequately and they might violate the law or cause some other kinds of problems and that would be no good. So that's a fairly rigorous path. In the context where this was taking place, this was appropriate. Uh, this effort reduced the training from 84 days down to 40 some days and reduced the need for a two week boot camp at the end of the formal training to actually teach people the real jobs. So this formalized all of that training across all these uh, regions and uh, tried to increase the shareability of content across the seven different paths. This next example here is, more, is a little bit more flexible. It's a guided menu. This followed on the heels of a Six Sigma project to create a global clinical trials process across all of Eli Lilly. Um, and so that, but this is not lockstep. People in different countries uh, play, had, wore different hats as part of the process. So it was difficult for my clients to prescribe exactly what by job title you would need. So that was gonna have to be a local decision and you'd look at this path and you would down select those things that were appropriate for the learner depending on you know their incoming knowledge and skills and their specific job assignments and tasks and outputs and one thing that my client did for in this case is that all the stuff at the bottom there in the blue big band those are events training and development events but they're kind of like learning word and access and spreadsheets and and those kinds of things and the client did not want those gunking up the very first phase of training because they look like low-hanging fruit and any executive that would look at this path would look at those things there and go yuck what this is garbage and wouldn't read through the rest of it to see all the key really critical performance oriented kind of content so we moved it so that wouldn't become an issue to the bottom there um, Again, this followed on the heels of a, of a Six Sigma project which generated a whole bunch of process data but not data that really got down to the nitty-gritty of task performance at the micro level, nor did it come up with the enabling knowledge and skills, which we'll be looking at here in the, in the next section. Uh, this one is a little bit more flexible. This is from AT&T. The architecture was first done in 86 and then updated in 89 and updated again in 92. Um, the 1000-2000 series are kind of basic, immediate, and, and advanced. Um, they had 1,100 people in the target audience and they did, there were eight major functions of the product manager's job and somebody might own all eight of them for a series of products or they might own a couple of those eight or they might own some slice of one of the eight. And so variability across the people with the same job title was tremendous and so this was a very open menu to allow people to cherry pick off of this the things that were important to them and their job performance requirements. Um, this next example, fairly open menu, this is one of two paths in this project, so I'm going to show you both. This is for the supervisors at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in the production department where they do repairs nowadays and they don't build new warships for the U.S. Navy, but they repair them. And uh, this, the events on this path here were a combination of uh, awareness and knowledge and skills building content. There were also performance tests that were used to qualify the target audience, uh, not through knowledge tests, but actually you know, do something in front of somebody who's sitting there with a set of criteria assessing whether or not Guy learned this adequately and can be checked off for that. So they use this to manage competence development um, and what was driving this project here is that back in the 2003, they were looking at uh, who was going to retire and when, and they were going to be dropping from 28 years experience in this job category down to five. And you're building and repairing or repairing U.S. warships when the nation is at war. And so it was very critical, and they needed to get their hands on this thing um, 
to begin to affect more proactively the development of performance competence. This is the second path, so you would go from being a supervisor to the zone manager path, but you were, if you were hired in as a zone manager, you'd actually have to back up to the supervisor path and take those things and learn things and prove your competence at the supervisor level and then tackle the things in the zone manager level, again, depending on what you brought into the job because you might have come from a different shipyard where you knew some of these things already, but there's unique things in this shipyard, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are some of the paths and all the boxes on the paths representing events or whatever you want to call them, courses, workshops, um, they, the little coding there, you can see the title, you can see whether it's a fully available as is or it's partially available, the half red dot or the blank dot that says we don't have anything at all. Um, whether the recommendation is, you know, elective, mandatory, highly recommended, so we give some clue to the managers and the target audiences that might be doing some planning. Um, and it used different deployment uh, approaches. The modes were basically group paste of various types, coached with a certified coach or just any old coach might do. Uh, self paced means uh, e learning, uh, read a book, read a manual. Uh, it might be augmented with something. So they had a whole variety of uh, different kinds of content that already existed that we were building around. Um, then, so for every one of these paths, a planning guide is produced. And I usually use these planning guides with my project steering team who looks at these paths and goes, holy moly here, what's, you trying to build an empire or what? Um, and they misread this as saying everybody's got to take everything on the path, which isn't true. So I use this planning tool here and uh, um, sometimes have to really uh, kind of dig in my heels and insist that everyone on the project steering team take this planning tool, this is one of four pages, but they basically pick a real live human being themselves back in the day when they had this job or somebody that they know that's in this job and basically down select through the planning tool mechanism what training might Guy need given his job assignment, given where he's coming from, and then we compare notes when they're done. I give them 10 minutes to do the plan, and it's amazing because they can get done with it in 10 minutes. And I have everybody add up how much time will each one of the, their targets spend in training, and somebody will come up, I got 21 days, somebody else will say, I got 42 days. And what they demonstrate to themselves is that this is a good planning tool. Um, it basically orients them to every last event on the path because they had to consider whether or not Guy needed this in his training or not and they could see how some people would need things and others wouldn't because of their background or their job assignment and so they saw the flexibility of this training and development path and because we use a, a, an approach to the titling of this content it was all about the performance that it enabled. And so there would be how to colon do this, how to colon do that. And so they could see, oh, my, the learner would actually know how to do that when this is done, theoretically, if it's all developed correctly. But um, so this is what one of those rows looks like. There's the event title, there's the delivery method code, there's the, it's either the actual length if it's training that already exists or it's our next best guess as to what it will be should we go build this if it's a current gap. The recommendation, this one is mandatory, so everybody's going to do this. And in the case of this shipyard project, they were going to build in the pre-tests so that Guy could test out of things that's, that are mandatory or highly recommended or elective. Um, and they could decide whether the learner's need, Guy's need, was high, medium, low, or zero. And create a target date and an actual date. And you know, their LMS did not uh, include the kind of tools to do that, so this was going to be useful for them afterwards. So thus far, before we launch into the uh, other parts of this, um, are there any questions? Next we're going to talk about the phases and the analysis data, etc. So again, uh, curriculum architecture design as a product and as a process. There are four phases in my standard approach to this. I've had to realign this and configure it differently because this was part of a larger project. If this was tied to DMAIC, it would look differently. Um, so project planning, 
generates a project plan and it's got the task plan and a schedule and the cost and price as an external consultant, as an internal, you may not have to do that, you may have to. I meet with the project steering team for a half a day to review this. I've done interviews before that, we create the draft plan, we create a presentation, we go into a project steering team meeting that's called a gate review meeting and their decision at the end of the meeting is to kill the project because it doesn't make any business sense modify the approach because it needs to be modified, it's not appropriate, uh, defer this because it's no longer timely and we need to wait for something else, or to sanction this and get on with it and populate the project with the people that we're going to need. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, that's the traffic light there underneath the first phase box. Um, and then we would move into analysis, of which we'll generate four specific types of analysis, various target audience data about the primary, secondary, and tertiary audiences. Primary, we intend to meet all of their needs. Secondary, we'll meet some of their needs, but not all of them. And tertiary are, are people that were, or job titles, that we're not going to address at all. And sometimes there are jobs that are close in, to the targets and we don't want confusion and so we're better off starting in the beginning declaring these people are outside the box, outside our scope, we're not addressing them. If that's an issue, call it out now because we can modify the approach going forward. But we don't want to find that out at the end of the project because that's way too late. Um, and then we want to look at the performance. What are the ideal performance? What's that look like? What are the current gaps, if that's appropriate to look at, and most of the time it is. What are the enabling knowledge and skills, and how do we matrix those against the, our performance model? I'll be showing examples of this here in the next section. Uh, and existing training and development assessments, or learning and development, or whatever you want to call your content. But let's assess the content now that we know what the performance requirements are, what the enabling knowledge and skills are. Let's not reinvent any wheels. Let's reuse whatever the shareholders have already paid for and repurpose that as is or after modification and check in with our uh, gate review meeting with our project steering team, the traffic light there, which is an upside down traffic light because it's a go light, not a stop light, um, and get their sanctioning for going forward with the analysis data. Is the analysis data accurate, complete, and appropriate? Is this what we should build our design around and support that performance with these enabling knowledge and skills. And so we do that check-in with the client so that they can uh, call that out. Usually it's a three-day meeting with an analysis team there at the bottom of the graphic, and the project team, uh, steering team meets for a full day, usually. Now, oftentimes I'm convinced by my clients to make it a half a day or three quarters of a day, and invariably we stay an entire day because there's a lot of business issues and there's a lot of insight that they gain in looking at the gap analysis against ideal performance that they want to talk about. Uh, we'll see this uh, in the next section here after I go through all this. So we go into the design phase and we produce the training and development path, the planning guide, which you've already seen. And there's two levels, the event and the modules. It's like books and chapters, and we specify four gaps. Well, if we were to have this gap event, here's its modularity. Here's the chapters in that book, so to speak. And so the clients can make decisions in the fourth phase when we do implementation planning where we prioritize the gaps of the curriculum. In some things, the gap, the priority is zero. Let it remain informal learning on structured OJT for the rest of its life. Let's not spend any nickels on that. Um, and then for the priority gaps that the client may actually fund the development and or acquisition of. Um, what's that, what is the cost model? So can we ballpark some of the costs so they can understand if we take the 10 top priorities, what will that cost us? First cost to develop it, make it ready to go. Um, and you can get into more sophisticated looks at, you know, what's the life cycle cost for that, how often will it have to be updated, et cetera, et cetera, so that they get some visibility. Because if they build it, will people come? And what are the long-term implications from a financial standpoint for actually uh, building content? And so we help the clients, uh, the stake clients and stakeholders on the project steering team make business decisions around instructional design kinds of things. That's the goal. We try to empower that project steering team. They handpick who are the people that we work with to produce this thing. Um, and we're uh, trying to collaborate with them. You'll see in the PACT uh, acronym up at the top left corner, customer and stakeholder driven. That C could have stood for collaboration. 
because we want to collaborate with our customers, but I wanted to actually be directed by the customers and have them have final say as to what we training folks are going to do for them because they live with the consequences of what we do for them and what we don't do for them. And that should be a conscious business decision and they should have final say on all of that. And if there aren't enough resources to make it happen, they need to come up with those too. All right. Um, so that's the first phase. Uh, the project steering team is really key and critical. In the second phase, when we do that design, we basic when we do this analysis, we basically work with these four types of folks: subject matter experts, master performers, novice performers, and management and supervisory personnel as appropriate. But we facilitate them in team meetings rather than doing a traditional interviews and observations of individuals, we bring them all together in a room to try to facilitate them. We can do this via individual analysis, interviews, and the document reviews, etc., but it takes longer and costs more to do this. But then on the other hand, it may not be feasible to pull together the master performers and subject matter experts that one might need to do this to make sure that it represents authentic performance requirements and we understand the gaps, etc. When we go into design, we take a subset of that analysis team of master performers and subject matter experts, and we have a seven-step process where we establish the path. There's a beginning and a middle and end. You see on the table there, BME. And we talk about well, what does the beginning mean? That's the onboarding part of a training and development path. Uh, and the M and the E, the middle and the end, that's the ongoing portion of a training and development path in my approach to this. So we establish what does that mean? When do we have the guy be done with the onboarding portion and then go into the ongoing portion? And we sort our performance data onto this path. We sort our existing training that we've assessed as being appropriate to be reused as is or after modification. We sort all the other knowledge and skills onto the path as to where would guy learn about access or the spreadsheet or Word or this policy and procedure or one of the other enabling knowledge and skills. And we accumulate content into modules and then accumulate them into events. It's like taking content and sorting it into the various chapters and then deciding, okay, which, how are we going to configure those chapters into a number of books? Um, and then we go back at the end, step seven is clean it all up, put the language in there, uh, estimate all of the times that the gap content might take now that we know what precedes it, what follows it. Are we revisiting certain things again by design or, you know, we've got redundancy by design, but not inadvertently. Um, and we go through all of that and produce the, the path and the planning guide so that we can go into this fourth phase and establish what those priorities so that we meet the needs of the client. Um, they live with the consequences of what we have in place. Uh, we can take them through a fairly rigorous but quick process um, to produce this so they can see how they'll reuse what we've got, what's missing, and make those business decisions as to whether or not to develop this over a two or three year period or that's not adequate to their needs and they need to find more resources so that we can build it out quicker. Um, so collaborating with them uh, and focused on the returns for investment which don't always need uh, ROI calculations done. They just know that if they solve some of their issues with some content in our analysis data later on we'll look at, we'll show you whether or not that's really a valid concept. Um, questions for me to answer at this point about the process? Um, yeah, there's a, I meet with the project steering team as a group if that's the question. Um, so we use the group process for analysis teams and design teams and implementation planning teams and there is the project steering team. And the projects that I have done, having done 74 of these, I'll say that probably about 12 to 15 of them were complete utter failures. Didn't go anywhere. My clients invariably uh, sometimes insist that, well, we don't really need a project steering team. I don't want to get too many people involved in all the decision making on this. Well, you get done with these projects here, you have all this data, it looks like a bunch of smoke and mirrors here, and nobody that's been through the entire process at the various gate review meetings trusts the data that's been generated. And the whole thing typically can kind of bog down there. So I use 
uh, and it's not, I'm not always able to do this, and it just makes it more complicated. It can be done, you know, individually going to people and checking in with them and reviewing things and hearing what they have to say and then talking to person two, three, and four and then circling back and covering with person one what persons two, three, and four said and just much easier <clears throat> to get everybody together, not always, but, but if you can, that's the way to do it, and have them have business-oriented discussions about instructional design. You know, do we have the right people picked to be on the analysis team, and, and is that you know is that the people we want others to emulate? You know, typically you're picking master performers, exemplars, accomplished performers, star performers, called many different things, and you want to bring them to consensus on what is that performance, and what are those knowledge and skills, and why do we have gaps? What's the cause of those? Is training actually going to be able to fix any of that stuff or not? So uh, I hope that answered that project steering team and group process question. All right, you were breaking up a little bit, but I guess the question is, you know, what if we don't have time to do this? Uh, um, then you do something else. But the project for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard uh, took uh, just around 40 days, business days, to do this, uh, just over two months. Um, and so it was a collaborative process, but yeah, if you can't, take the time to do this, then you just do incremental development and acquisition without a long-term blueprint or architecture for where does this all lead. And if you do a lot of rapid development, you can end up at the end of the day, the week, the month, the year with a lot of overlapping and gapped content. And hopefully what's missing is unimportant and hopefully what is overlapped is reinforcing. But most of the time I'm called into situations where the curricula are a total mess. It's evolved over time. There's no rhyme or reason for any of it. Or we've merged uh, seven times with other banks or other entities and we've got all these sets of curricula we're maintaining and we'd like to get it down to one. So uh, I, don't do, I don't suggest to my clients that they do curriculum architectures on every last target audience they have. This is for where it's really critical and important that you get the training and development right, that there are returns for the investment, you know, risks to be avoided and rewards to be achieved, um, and that you go through this kind of process when it's worthy. Now, in the short run, you can go and build content, hitting some of the priority target needs, and then come around later on and do a curriculum architecture. It does not have to precede it because part of my methodology is looking at existing content. So if you built something and did it modular or not, you could come along and do a quick architecture later on and make sure you surrounded the right things. But the, the issue is to avoid the critical gaps and to avoid unnecessary overlaps that may be redundant using different language and models and things like that, confusing the learner. Um, I hope that answers that. Yeah, the cycle times are usually an issue, and I know that, you know, guys created this engineering approach to this thing, and it looks unwieldy, it doesn't look very flexible, it looks like it takes a long time, but it doesn't. And I've done one of these projects in 10 days when everybody, the project steering team, the analysis and design team, everybody was in the room for the 10 days, and we just crunched through the whole darn thing. And it was messy, and we didn't pretty it up with an analysis report and design document. It was just all on the wall on flip chart pages. And when we were done, the clients saw the whole thing unfold in front of their very eyes. And they were able to prioritize where to spend their money and go into addy like development efforts, given the guidance of the events and modules of the curriculum. Um, and they could build it out there and have some confidence that uh, they were going to be building things that were worthy from their business perspective, um, and not just content that could be developed. All right, so uh, moving on, if that's okay. Um, in an enterprise learning context, it's not just about learning. It's really all about performance. So having analysis of performance is really critical. And for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, uh, that was two levels of management. So I have a management model here I'm starting off with, but the goal is to create what I call areas of performance. They're kind of major duties, key results areas, lots of different language for the same concept. So, you know, whenever I'm in a client organization where they say, we call that major duties, then that's what we call it, major duties. But 
in all of my writings and all that stuff, I call these areas performance, chunks of the performance. And in this case here, we have a leadership model that basically says there's chunks of managerial performance that are more leadership and some of it's more core and some of it's more support. Again, arbitrary labels for these things that you may feel a need to change. Um, but we use this as the framework to jump in and capture, you know, what does a manager, supervisor do for a living at the Norfolk Naval Shipyards. And of the uh, boxes on the chart here, there's 14 boxes there, uh, areas of performance. They didn't do all of them. They didn't do that second box up at the top there, the strategic planning and management. Uh, their bosses did that stuff, but they didn't. Now, right or wrong or indifferent here, but they didn't. So that was a question later on for the project steering team is that, hmm, they say they don't do that. They do the first box, they do the sec third box, but they don't do that second one. Um, and either that's a gap in their assignments and expectations, or that's just the way it is, and move on. And that's what they said, move on. For every one of those areas of performance, one of those boxes, which is a segmentation scheme, you take the world of performance for a target audience and you, you divide it up. So you can look at it piece by piece, understand the relationships of one piece to all the rest of them, yes, but basically you can't tackle the whole thing, so you got to segment it. So in this one here, uh, for the area performance of stakeholder relationship management and system governments, governance, which is basically listen to all your stakeholders, listen to what they tell you to do, what you're doing well, what you're not doing well, what you're going to be doing for them in the future, get ready, and now govern your entire system as a manager to get aligned and meet their demands and needs. So that was the first part of the chunk here and then we're going to look at the outputs and their measures. How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the key tasks associated with each one of those outputs? So we're doing task analysis but within the context of outputs within the context of areas of performance. And who does what in the roles and responsibility here? Uh, who's doing that first task, identifying the derailers? Well, that can happen at every level of management. And we were intentionally studying two levels, the one and two columns there. But there, the number two's boss was actually doing that as well, as one might expect. Um, and then that's ideal performance. And so what are the typical performance gaps? What are the probable gap causes? We're not doing root cause analysis here. We don't have time. We're in a hurry. So we're doing off the tops of the heads of the master performers assembled. You know, what, what's probably causing this? And it's a weasel word. It's not root cause. It's probable cause. And what of those causes then are due to a deficiency of the environment, a DE, or a DK, a deficiency of the knowledge and skills of the performers that we're looking at? or deficiency of the individual attributes and values of those performers that we're looking at. Because training or learning can only deal with the deficiencies of knowledge. And so there's DEs on here that training isn't going to fix. But we do still capture this information because we can give a heads up to the learners when we train them on, here's deficiencies in the environment, the shipyard, we're at war, we can't afford to fix all these things, you're going to have to live with it, you're going to have to figure out how to deal with this, how to avoid it. If it's unavoidable, we'll give you the strategies and tactics of the master performers as they deal with these same things. That's why they're master performers, because they know how to deal with those things. So we have visibility now for what's ideal performance on the left and what's the current performance state on the right, not with everybody. Master performers don't have these issues, the non-master performers do. So. This is what we've learned now, and it's all aligned to the outputs, uh, beginning with the end of mind, of uh, the outputs that need to be performed. So that's one example. There was, I think, uh, almost 30 pages of charts like this, performance model charts, that articulated, captured a consensus from the analysis team as to what the job was. From there, we then systematically derived the enabling knowledge and skills. And I have 17 categories of knowledge and skills here. Um, and not every category was used in this project. Uh, you can see the ones that are faded out in the background there. They, they weren't used. Um, and there's um, um, a, this is a knowledge and skill matrix. So for one of the categories, uh, the company policies and procedures category, um, Here's the policies and procedures that one needed to use to do the job. And we've got this organized by those areas of performance, uh, which is coded in the rows and down at the bottom of the page there. 
So we know that when we code of ethics, uh, that's used in every part of my job. And the Union Red Book was used in every part of my job, but the Shipyard Instruction 4770.7 is only used in three parts of my job. So now I can basically then later on assess existing content on the Code of Ethics and see does it really tell Guy, the learner, the performer, how to apply ethics in these parts of the job or is this just Code of Ethics in general? Um, you know, is it gets specific down to how he should perform? And if it's not, that potentially could be a gap. But well, we gather that data here and we there's other columns past the links to the areas of performance there and it says select or train. Do we select people who already know this? Do we, or do we is there a training implication here because the selection system does not have a showstopper on any of these and so the default here is training. How critical is this to my ability to be a master performer, high, medium, or low? How difficult is it for the, for the average typical person to learn, high, medium, or low? How volatile is this content, high, medium, or low? What depth of coverage do we need to take this content if it's going to be in training? Is this to create awareness within the learner? Deeper knowledge within the learner? Or we expect skills, hands-on, skills-building kinds of things in the training. That's what we expect. Uh, and then the ETA link, the existing training assessment. So did we find content that covers Code of Ethics? Yes, it's in that uh, thing B-007. So we, there's, again, the 17 categories of knowledge and skills. You don't you always use all of them, but this is how we organize a systematic approach to deriving the enabling knowledge and skills that enable that performance that's captured on the performance model. Uh, as point of reference here for that Norfolk Naval Shipyard, there were 71 outputs and then clusters of task data and the gap analysis all aligned to those 71 outputs and in their case they had 169 discrete knowledge and skill items across those uh, less than 17 uh, knowledge and skill categories and so that's the analysis data that's going to go into the curriculum architecture design later on. Um, in the call center there were 34 outputs and 416 discrete knowledge and skill items so you can see it varies less number of outputs but more knowledge and skills and other things here. Questions? While we're waiting for the questions here, part of the goal is that once you put this kind of stuff in place, you've created a modular curriculum that where a lot of that content can be used for other audiences. Now I call the type of target audience, those critical target audiences that you want to do this for the push target audiences, because actually they're so critical that you want to push this content down their throats, into their heads, however you want to say that, so that they, you know that they know this and that they can perform. You want to really do that. But for the pull target audiences uh, that aren't as critical, you'll generate a lot of content that can serve their needs as well, but you wouldn't do it from a return on investment where the returns are rewards to be achieved or risks to be avoided. They're just not that critical, but you can serve them with content that was built for deliberately for others and can meet their needs. Maybe not 100% spot on, but it maybe gets them close enough. And so this is a way to allocate resources to the more critical target audiences. But do we have a question or shall I move on? Okay. So, uh, we're kind of getting near the end here, and I can back up and cover every, everything uh, to everyone's heart's content. But, um, all right, so, kind of in summary here, if you approach this in some similar fashion, you know, there's more than one way to do this. I've got my way as codified, and but on all my projects and my clients' projects that my staff undertook, we modify this. It's, it's, you've got to fit the situational context there. But if you increase, if you uh, take this kind of approach, whether you call it a process model or a performance model or a process map or something like that that gets you down to authentic performance requirements, you'll have a greater performance impact with your content, both instruction and information, uh, before the need or at the moment of need. Um, you know, we train firefighters to fight fires, hoping that they never have to fight a fire. But if they do, it's too late in the moment of need. And so, you know, we have to approach all of this and understand that performance context of the learners, the performers. But 
this kind of approach with the anchor on performance. We know what outputs guys should produce. We know how to measure them. We can tell a good one from a bad one. We know what the tasks are. Gee, we already know what the application exercise in any eventual training might be. We should have him perform those tasks, real work, simulated work, or further apart simulated work, but perform those tasks to produce those outputs and we know how to measure that. So we've actually got visibility when we're done with analysis about what the practice exercises should be. Um, and then it's a matter of can he do real work or is that problematic for some reason and we need to simulate it in some fashion. Um, if you take an approach to this to look at the modular design where you have events or whatever you want to call them and something underneath that, units, lessons, uh, I use the term module um, at this stage of my ISD methodology so that I have events and modules and later on when we, if it's a gap and a high priority and you move that into some anti like process later on, I change the module to lessons. And for example, if I had an event with four modules in it and now we know we're serious about building this thing, let's take a look at that modularity inside the event and we might decide that actually what we need is three lessons instead of four modules or seven lessons instead of four modules. And now we can think a little bit differently about this, but the point of creating modularity in the curriculum architecture design was one, to give it visibility so that business decisions can be made about the priority of this gap because we understand what performance it's going to address. And either that performance is high value, high critical, or it's low hanging fruit, and we don't really care. Guy, we think they'll learn it one way or another. We really don't need to build content for that. It, let informal learning uh, take over at that point. Or no, we don't trust formal learn informal learning. This is too critical. It's got risk implications or whatever. And so let's uh, address this more formally and spend our money wisely on those kinds of things. <clears throat> so the modular design reuse then, if you approach curriculum architecture of paths, whatever you want to call these things, roadmaps, um, in a modular fashion here, and with the intent not to only serve this immediate target audience that you're looking at, but keeping in the back of your mind as the designer other target audiences that we may that we're going to face for sure or that we may face someday, how do I understand whether or not I can take content A and B and keep them segregated or merge them together? I need to be thinking about who are there audiences out there that could use A but don't need B and vice versa? Or does everybody need A and B combined all the time and so it's okay to do that? So when I do a, my design and deal with content and segregate it or combine it I've got to be thinking about this. Now, if I do this correctly here, for other target audiences, I will reduce development times and costs because I'm going to be able to use more and more of their content as is or after modification. Perhaps if I have an active listening module, I just need to change some of the examples of what the learner's performance context is and change the demonstration so it's more authentic to this next new learner and change out the practice exercises so it's exactly what we're expecting them to do on the job. But active listening is active listening is active listening except in the authentic applications of each target audience. So I can approach design of, at a curriculum architecture level or at my ADDI level with this modular concept. It's not learning objects as that concept has been uh, generally uh, approached and deployed. Um, it's lower levels of modularity than that. But I should be able to reduce development times and costs, my inventory systems costs, because I'm going to be having less redundant content. Less redundant content means I'm going to reduce my administrative costs. My deployment system costs, if I get redundancy out of content, which, isn't, which is not an issue for everyone, but is an issue often enough, in all the projects that I've done, there's redundant content. That Na Norfolk Naval Shipyard uh, project, uh, when we went and looked for the existing training after we had done the performance and the enabling knowledge and skills analysis, we found 27 two-hour modules on active listening. Our, uh, our taxpayer dollars at work. Um, 
And when we, my client took a look at all of that, had to spend 54 hours looking at 27 two-hour modules to decide which one or two or three would we include in the curriculum going forward. Um, he was just kind of disgusted with all the fact of all this redundancy and different language and models, and so some of them were okay, except they used totally different language than what would have what they found in other pieces of content. So, so we can reduce deployment system costs, whether that's deploying it proactively or making it accessible. Um, and also, if we reduce redundancy through a modular approach to design, we'll reduce our maintenance system costs because we won't have 27 two-hour modules on active listening. We'll have one, maybe, or two or three if, it's, if that's really necessary. So there's a lot of value here in improving performance impact and oftentimes with clients when they see the performance model data and they can relate to that because, yeah, that's, those are the tasks, those are the outputs people produce. My God, let's, that's, that's what we need. We need training on how to do that. So it's a task orientation versus a topic orientation to curricula. Um, and even if there were topics of enabling knowledge and skills, we can see how they relate to the terminal performance objectives. Um, a lot of other benefits come out of this kind of approach. Your performance model gives you the terminal uh, learning objectives and the enabling knowledge and skills give you a lot of the enabling learning objectives. Now, as uh, is there, so are there are any follow-up questions from the group here, or have I uh, stunned you all into submission here with uh, over uh, a cognitive load? It's possible. While we're perhaps waiting for a couple comments here, um, I, I do have some books for sale, uh, but the books that this, this six-pack here was configured off of my Lean ISD book. I offer that as a free PDF and as a paperback as well. Same thing with the Training and Development Systems View book and Management Areas of Performance, some of my earlier books. I reconfigured all of my books and articles and columns, quarterly columns that I was doing in other places into this book six-pack, uh, more aligned at various roles and how they might play out. But I've also on my website have uh, a series of uh, articles for free and presentations and video podcasts and audio podcasts and again these free books. Um, so I have lots of resources um, that people might find helpful um, and my general rule, one of many general rules is you know adopt what you can, adapt the rest. So I fully appreciate that uh, adaptation is key and critical you may have other things in place you need to align to. You may have prevailing approaches and you need to align to those things rather than changing all of that. I think that this can be flexible. It's really about you know getting in agreement and alignment with your customers about who you're going to tackle, what's the scope of that, then going and understanding the performance, understanding the enabling knowledge and skills, understanding what content already exists, then designing a flexible path or a rigorous path, depending on the need, and the requirements, um, and then building that up. And you can build redundancy. You know, Will Tallheimer talks about uh, spaced uh, learnings, uh, spaced repetition, and you can build that in an architecture, in a path. But if you do one off development efforts, then you may or may not actually get that. You may have redundancy not by design, but inadvertent. Um, and maybe that's an issue, and maybe it's not. Maybe you got lucky. So there's different approaches to doing this. It's not for every target audience, um, but if you tackled uh, your top 10 target audiences doing something like this, you would have generated a lot of content that would meet the needs of many in the audience. We didn't focus on the beginning of a learning path, but that's the onboarding, and once you develop that kind of content for your critical target audiences, almost all of that can be used by other non-critical target audiences. So there's a way to configure the whole onboarding with an eye towards performance, competence, development. You know, for me, the first, the beginning of a training and development path is onboarding, and that basically gives the people their orientation and their immediate survival skills. If they're an airplane pilot, that's learning the whole job as part of onboarding before you take the wheel. But most jobs, you don't need to learn everything. You can learn some of it over time on the job, rely on your workmates. Um, so you have to understand that situation. 
And I think that when you use a group process and you use master performers in your analysis and your design efforts, they make sure that what you've got is accurate, complete enough, and mostly, most important, appropriate. Appropriate to the real world context that they live in. They know what's feasible and what's not. And they can provide you that kind of guidance when you're doing your design, when you're deciding, should this be e-learning or should this be a coached session or what? And they know what's real and most desirable. And things that are most desirable just may not be feasible in their world and they know that and they'll stop you from doing that. That's the benefit. Plus you have a whole bunch of people that are all bought into the whole thing and that can carry forward when you go into your addy level efforts and you need to find master performers and subject matter experts that can help leverage those people free. Um, and that's been a, a, a huge thing for my clients is that these teams of master performers that were on the analysis and design teams are very, they got a lot of skin in the game at that point and they want to continue on with the, uh, with the actual development and or acquisition. Well, I'm sorry that we weren't able to be a little bit more interactive. Um, and if you have follow-up questions, if you want to channel them through MJ, then she can forward them to me and she can inform everybody as appropriate. Thank you, everyone.